My husband has a second family. I contacted the wife, and it turns out there's way more to this. The ultimate cliche has happened in my life, and I am absolutely broken. My husband, my rock, has been having an affair for over 17 years. We have been married for over 25 years. We have three beautiful children, two in college and one who still lives at home. But turns out he's had another set this whole time. My husband is an insurance broker. He has multiple branches over the country which he spends week on, week off. Turns out on his week off, he's been with his other family in Albuquerque, where his other branch is. He's got a fiance who he has two kids with, both in their early teens. I found out when I went to make a new Facebook account, and when I searched my husband's first name, another profile with another last name popped up, and through that profile were the links to his fiance's and other kids' Facebooks. My husband is currently with said family, and I know it's him because his most recent post is a photo of him and that other family eating dinner. Amongst those photos were photos of him kissing the girl, and him being fatherly with the kids who look nearly identical to my husband. I am absolutely broken. Almost every part of me wants to scream in his face and reprimand him for ruining my life, but another part of me wants to pretend to be ignorant and let it be. <coughs> Because our life is peaceful. He's good with our kids. He's the main source of financial income. He's loving, but he's also all of those things to another family. Not only would I be tearing a gaping hole into my family, I'd be opening up a vortex for them too. My heart is in shambles. I've never cried so much in my life. My youngest son is currently on a graduation trip with friends, and I am alone until my lying, cheating, evil husband comes home. My life is absolutely wrecked. It's literally a movie plot. I'm hoping he'll just come home and it'll be a big misunderstanding why he's kissing a woman with a ring on her finger. I don't know what to do anymore. I'm tempted to pack a bag and just leave. I can't be in the home where we've raised our kids, where we've spent every Christmas for the last 26 years, and where I've been alone on New Year's taking care of our babies while he works his ass off. I just can't. I want to leave a note for him to come home to, hurt him like he's hurt me, but I don't think that's possible. I don't know how I will ever face him again. Update, four days later. This is a follow-up. Firstly, thank you so much for the advice. I'm not in any means good with legal things, so all legal advice has been noted. I have rung up an attorney. We are discussing the process. He's also told me to gather as much evidence as I could, such as photos of the Facebook pages, text messages, and recent flight information. All has been put into a folder, and I'll present it to a judge or jury when we get into some sort of divorce proceeding. Again, not fully clear with the specifics, but it's a good sign. I have also been in contact with the other woman. I've told her, explained the situation, and she was equally as distraught. From what I'm aware, she's financially independent from him, and they don't share property, so it seems very clean-cut on her behalf. My husband is aware of the fact I know, and is currently staying in a hotel, but he is unaware of the fact that the other woman knows. I confronted him when he walked through the door. He started to cry and plead, and it was honestly kind of pathetic. I mean, I was crying too, but I've chosen to think of him as a pathetic coward for doing this because he is. But anyways, I have my name on the property, we both do, so it's not like I can just kick him out, but he's chosen to stay away for my sake. All I am thinking though, is if he chose to stay away for my sake, maybe being faithful for my sake should have been considered too. Despite this, he's staying away. He's in a hotel downtown where he calls very few hours to check up. I am no longer sad. Well, I am, but I'm way more furious than sad currently. My kids still have no idea, and my youngest thinks my husband is just working more in Albuquerque because of business problems. I'm still confused at how to tell them they have two half-siblings and two parents, one with an extra backup parent. I'm just feeling very, very unappreciated and unwanted lately, but your kind words have been so helpful. Thank you guys so much. Much love. Update post. Six months later. Firstly, I would like to start off by thanking everyone who had positive things to say. The widespread support has been so helpful during this period, and I am truly amazed at the kindness shown to me. Thank you. And now, the update. I won't be going into details about the divorce because it is still ongoing, but do rest assured, it is happening. A few people seemed worried I was going to stay with him, and for a period of time, I would have. But no, we are divorcing. On that note, I have completely cut contact with him. Our contact is through lawyers only. 
He officially moved out of the house, and my middle moved back in to help out over the break. My kids have, to my knowledge, cut most contact with him, but I haven't asked as it is not my place. Also, custody isn't a problem because my youngest turned 18 recently. We have also been in contact with the other family, and we even spent Christmas together. Despite being a little awkward at first, me and his ex fiance are trying our hardest to bring the kids together harmoniously. And that'll be the last update. I'm logging off Reddit now. I will continue living my life. I'll try to support my kids through theirs, but I'll forever be thankful for the support and love you all have shown. Yours truly and sincerely, OP. Okay, so I like to approach most topics seriously or with a sense of humor. I'm gonna go to the right and approach it with a sense of humor and have to say, wow, he got away with it for 17 years. I don't approve of what he did, but like, holy crap, like secret agents could learn a thing or two from this guy, but partners could not. Fathers could not. Mothers could not. This guy lied for 17 years. He had another family, and he thought there was nothing wrong with that. The only thing I wish we would have heard was, like, how the origin of that started, because that is a crazy thing. That is, like, level 99 cheating. That is... He's two people. That is two worlds he is living in. But I... Good for OP. Good for the family. She got the divorce. She didn't stay with him because that could have been bad for her mental health. And now the kid and the ex-wife are trying to come together harmoniously. So, uh, good ending, I guess? But anyway, guys, next story. Story number two. My wife, F32, recently had wine spilled on her by my best friend, F31, during our wedding. Now she is demanding that I, M33, cut ties. Me and Allie met through a mutual friend in 2012 during a pub quiz at university. I was quite attracted to her and actually told her so at the end of the evening, but she told me she had a boyfriend even though she was flattered all the same. Fast forward three years later, I met Eliza at the Edinburgh Fringe and we just clicked immediately. Politics, music, cinema, whatever the subject approached, there was a spark that I had never felt with anyone else. It's like she just made sense with me. Her personality was just vivid. It's hard to describe, but I'll try. On first impression, she was so knowledgeable and enthusiastic. I was taken aback by her intensity. From that point onwards, we were inseparable, and I was dead certain of our future together long before we got engaged. Then enter Allie again. I start a new job at an advertising firm with a position in web design, and she was one of the only people I knew. At first, it was a little awkward given our history, especially considering that she was now married to the boyfriend she was dating back then. But there was no one else I knew at the firm, and we both had partners at this point, so it couldn't hurt to be friends, right? And to be honest, I'm glad, because I feel like our chemistry as friends superseded any potential we might have had as a couple. She's clever and has a bit of a cheeky personality. I am quite dry and sarcastic myself, so I reckon we have a pretty fun dynamic. Eliza doesn't seem to feel that way though. Sometimes when it's been the three of us, she has expressed a feeling of being left out or that Ali has been making fun of her. I don't see it, it's just our dynamic, but there have been a couple of nights where Eliza's been in tears because of something that Ali has said. One time, Eliza got out of her seat and Ali sat down where she was sitting to show me a YouTube video. When Eliza came back in, she saw Ali leaning next to me and was upset for the rest of the night. Sometimes there have been times when Ali has said something that Eliza has read as a come on. Like when I said I missed swimming because I felt out of shape, and Ali said, the two of us should go together with a playful punch. Eliza didn't say anything at the time, but her discomfort was visible. Things really came to a head though on our wedding, and I think the stress of it really got to Eliza. During the reception, Ali bumped into her and red wine spilled all over her dress. She was bawling the entire evening. We're now on our honeymoon, and Eliza has said she hopes for a fresh start, but she feels like Allie might have spilled her wine on her on purpose. She is suggesting that I cut ties with her, and if I'm honest, I'm not so sure I want to. Where do I go from here? Here are some relevant comments. User 1 said, The number of times I've bumped into someone and spilt my drink on them is exactly once in my entire life, and I was a teenager. You are either astoundingly naive, or Allie is somehow the unluckiest woman in the world to have accidentally spilled her red wine on the bride on her wedding day. I think you know which one is more likely. Your wife won't be staying your wife for much longer unless you start actually listening to her and stop dismissing all of her fears as baseless insecurities. 
Then OP said Allie was getting drinks from the bar. Eliza had taken off part of her gown for dining and dancing purposes and was leaving our bedroom to return to our table. They bumped into each other and Eliza had a huge red stain over her dress. Allie made an offhand joke and fled, and Eliza ran up to me in bits and pieces. It sounded really bad when Eliza told me, and she was in bits about the wine spilling all over her dress, and I went to Allie and asked her what the hell she was up to. Allie was so mortified and told me she wanted to sink into a hole. She's dyspraxic and has struggled with falling at impromptu moments. I've actually witnessed it happening before. There was a meeting at work and she gets our colleague's coffee. The moment she came in, she tripped and fell. Coffee flying everywhere. Then user two said, Allie bumped into your wife in her wedding dress, spilling wine all over it and made an offhand joke before fleeing? What kind of response is that? She is a really awkward person and doesn't know how to interact with people sometimes. There have been a few times I've been upset with her because of how glib she's been about personal issues. Then user three said, so someone who has a habit of accidentally saying or doing things that make your wife cry accidentally also managed to spill red wine over her white dress on the biggest day of her life? And you don't think that's at all suspicious? If you knew, and imagine here that you somehow knew for certain, that she had done it on purpose, what would your reaction be? Would it change how you thought about her? Give it some thought. I would be really hurt if Allie was doing it on purpose. I love Eliza and want us to be happy, and I can see that I've really effed up here, multiple times. Allie is a good friend, but if she's deliberately being a wind-up merchant and harming my marriage, then I'll have to cut the cord and stop chumming up to her so much. Eliza sometimes says to me that she can intuit people's opinions and feelings within minutes of meeting them. I've never been like that. My folks have always said that I'm terrible with picking up on basic things. I was at an aunt's house when I was a kid, talking her ear off, and she said, Oh, it's getting late multiple times. And it was only until my mom dragged me out that I picked up that she wanted me to leave. Then user 4 said, It really sounds like you're putting your friend first. No wonder your wife is unhappy. She comes back in tears from hanging out, and you still invite Allie to the wedding? What was the conversation like? She got really upset one time during banter because me and Allie like to roast each other regularly, and Allie roasted her a little too hard, I guess. We were singling out things to insult each other on, and the subject went to Eliza, and Eliza mentioned that she had webbed feet. Since then, Allie's called her Leapfrog. When I say it, Eliza takes it in good stride, but when Allie says it, it's this massive problem. I don't get it. Eliza has suggested that Allie's being serious when she says it as opposed to when I do, but she roasts me the same way too. She said, I looked like a juggalo's poodle that day because I was wearing baggy metal clothes and hadn't styled my hair, so it was frizzing all over the place. And finally, user 5 said, why haven't you stuck up for your wife all those times Allie has hurt her? I guess because I didn't know that I needed to? It seems like it's a perspective thing. Eliza is a passionate person who cries at deluxe puppy adverts, and the intensity is great for a partner, but it can cause problems with friendships. She reads a lot into things her friends do thinking it's intentional, and when she talks to them about what they did, they will be completely shocked and unaware that they hurt her. Ali is a very sarcastic person in general, who rolls with the punches, and to me, it reads like they struggle to gel rather than intentional cruelty on Ali's part. But for what it's worth, Ali has told me that she's really keen on Eliza, and thinks she's a top girl. Update. You know, I posted here recently looking for guidance on how to deal with my wife's anxiety and hurt revolving around my friend, and it seems like I got read the riot act, probably rightly so. I have been completely inconsiderate of Eliza's feelings and how she feels about these roastings, and you alerted me to the possibility that Allie is doing this just to be a little twerp. I sat down with Eliza, and we had an in-depth conversation about the wedding incident. I got her to describe the event step by step in her words. She said, I was leaving the lobby into the dining venue, and Allie was a little tipsy at this point and already stumbling from the bar. She was initially walking slower, but seemed to speed up when she saw me. We collided into each other and she pulled an ashamed face and made a joke about me looking like Rosamund Pike in Gone Girl before scurrying away. She seemed embarrassed in the moment, but she didn't apologize to me. I heard from other people that she was appalled about what happened, but I never heard anything from her directly. It just paints a picture of habitual microaggressions from her that has festered into this ugly anxiety whenever she's around. 
I pretty much predict whenever I'm in her vicinity that there will be weird behavior or uncomfortable comments, and I don't want to be continue being in a situation where my husband brings someone into my home who resents me for simply existing. That was a real gut punch to me. For me, I always felt like it was just insecurity about me fancying Allie for 10 minutes yonks ago, but Eliza is really torn up about this. She's said that the honeymoon has been miserable because the memory has been swirling around in her mind, and she feels like I'm going to downplay or dismiss it. No one should feel like that they can't just be themselves, especially not at home. I didn't realize what a jerk I had been, and I apologized profusely to Eliza and decided to phone up Allie to confront her about the wedding incident. So I did it, and it didn't go well. Basically, I told her that Eliza was really hurt by the wedding dress incident, that she had been hurt by her behavior for a long time, and that if she can't bring herself to apologize to Eliza's face, at least she should pay towards getting the stain removed. And if she couldn't bring herself to at least even do that, then our friendship had to stop. To say that Allie was taken aback would be an understatement. She was completely blindsided, asking what was wrong with their interactions that made me want to go to such extremes. I mentioned the leapfrog comment, and she went, but even you call her that, stating that Eliza called her Garfield because of her weight and bright orange hair. When I mentioned that she ran towards Eliza and didn't apologize for spilling wine on her, she got really upset and started shouting that she wasn't running at her to hurl wine at her dress. She was running from her because she didn't want to talk at that moment because she feels like Eliza hates her, and she doesn't know how to go about it. She started pointing out times when Eliza had been funny towards her, and I basically said, Right, but this isn't about when Eliza has hurt you. This is about when you've hurt Eliza, and it got so bad that it needs to be talked about. And she started laughing. It was really uncomfortable. I know she does this when she's anxious about something. Eliza asked me if things were okay from the other room, and Allie demanded if this was set up, and when I tried to explain myself, she hung up. Her husband even phoned me, insisting that he would pay for the damage if it is less stressful for me. I told Ewan, her husband, that I appreciated that, but I needed to know where Allie stood regarding what I just said. Ewan told me that Allie makes jokes whenever she's anxious or uncomfortable, and that they've wrote about it in the past, but the wedding dress incident is a major issue that he wants to smooth things over as much as I do. So, him and Allie will pay towards dry cleaning, whilst a condolences hamper is sent to Eliza. Eliza was relieved that Ewan was so understanding, but she wasn't thrilled about Allie's reaction basically said that the Garfield comment was always about her hair and never about her weight, and that she was deliberately trying to make it seem like the bad behavior went both ways. I don't think it's went both ways either, because I've never noticed Eliza roasting Allie in any real way. Eliza has suggested we try marriage counseling. I was a bit shocked at first, because we've only been married a month, but I decided maybe that's the way forward, because if Eliza reckons that we need counseling for it, then it's clearly a problem. So yeah, me and Eliza are going to try marriage counseling, and my future with Ali is uncertain. Update number two. So after the rightly deserved bollocking you gave me in the last post, you'll be happy to learn that Ali and me aren't talking anymore, and it's probably for the best. Eliza and me received the condolences hamper in the post, and it was primarily soap. Not in the sense of fragrant body lotions or luxury packages or even organic bars. Just regular, run-of-the-mill soaps. There were two dispensers that were faintly rose-scented, but it was so mild you had to really look for it. There were several white soap bars that didn't smell of anything. Really, it was so confusing. The only items that suggested it was a proper gift basket were a six-pound bottle of Chardonnay and a box of Rose's chocolates that looked a far deal more effort than the cleaning equipment at the nearest pub. The weirdest item, though? A pair of woman's underpants. Not lingerie, not anything lacy or risque, like just a plain pair of white pants. They were actually kind of grubby. There was a faint orange lining on them. It just didn't make sense to me, because if they were meant to be for Eliza, they were at least six sizes is too big, and if Allie really was making a move on me, they were again around six sizes too big. Also, why would she choose such disgusting pants to try and seduce me? It weirded me out so much that I rung up Allie asking why I had soap and grubby knickers in our condolences hamper. She kept making dry remarks to her husband about there being a strange noise on the other end of the phone. I didn't get anywhere with her and insisted that Ewan should talk to me instead, because getting anywhere with her was like pulling teeth at this rate. After some disgruntled remarks, she 
passed the phone over. Ewan asked what was up, and I explained the whole situation. He was momentarily surprised when I described the hamper as looking like the luggage of a janitor that lived under a bridge. He said that it was a small package, but there should have been several luxury gifts that weren't simply sanitary items. Apparently, there was a bottle of Chardonnay, a bottle of Shiraz, one box of rose chocolates, a lint bar, and a selection of crackers and some assorted cheeses. Somehow, that got replaced with leftover soaps bought in bulk and his wife fronts that Ali found ever so hilarious, and apparently found ever so hilarious to send to my wife. He was hugely apologetic and embarrassed, stating that he'd pay us the cost towards the lost items. I was raging at this point, but I tried to be collected and said, right, let me talk to Ali again, please and got her on the line. I told her that she had the chance to make it right, and she blew it. And she groaned, and told me that Eliza's jealousy has crippled our friendship, and she was sick of having to flatter her insecurities. I said, no, you are Eliza's insecurities, and we rode for a bit. Eventually, it ended with me saying that this had been building up for a while, and that her attitude had been giving Eliza grief for years. Allie said none of this would be happening if Eliza knew how to take a joke, and I just told her that a joke isn't ruining her wedding dress, and then sending her your husband's stinky wife runs. She said I sold out my principles for a girl who's threatened by other women. After the phone call, Eliza was not so much hurt as she was confused at first, because she was wondering if there was a mix-up until I explained to her the joke. She seemed pretty much resigned to the idea that Allie would always be a twerp, and I told her the likelihood of that happening was very slim, considering she's cut me off for standing up for her. I think the counseling has made us stronger, and in a weird way, I'm glad this has happened. Because if your friendship falls apart the moment you try to protect your loved ones, then they probably weren't that strong friendships at all. Shame I won't be speaking to you in from now on. He is a top lad. Now, here are some more relevant comments. User1 said, I just hope that you finally feel stupid and you apologize and make it up to your wife. How how the hell you didn't know your friend was bullying your wife is beyond me. I have apologized to Eliza multiple times. I should have been more assertive with Allie and told her to cut the crap back then. I am aware that this is entirely on me for being permissive towards someone who is really just a bully towards my wife, and I am trying to do better. Then user 2 said, I'm glad you're seeing light, but why were you permissive before? Why was it only now did you finally believe her and confront Allie? Did you like the attention? Was it easier to dismiss your wife's concerns as being petty over a crush than to critically consider her feelings and the situation? Also, don't you still work with Allie? I think it was because I saw it as lost in translation. Like it was something that worked with me and Allie, but it didn't with her. And assumed that she would figure that it was the sort of banter we encouraged and join in at some point. Eliza is from a very sincere, straightforward family that say what they mean and don't necessarily make jokes like I do. The whole idea would be lost on them, and they would be really confused and upset thinking they were actually insulting each other. Eliza's brother nearly jumped me once because I just said that's plenty when she was rambling a little. That's a still game reference for the transatlantic pals across the world. I like it when she rambles. I think it's cute and it's a running joke between us. But he found it so personally offensive though. Like he thought I was just telling her to put a sock in it and started rambling at me for disrespecting his sister like that. Eliza started hiding her face in shame. It was that extreme of a reaction. I think I should have been paying more attention though. Eliza told me that when she's tried to chat to her, Ali's just been like, I don't do small talk, and they've sat in complete silence. Apparently, when she tried to chat at another time, she was totally non-committal and yawned so loud that it woke up our dog. I only found this out recently because Eliza didn't want to inconvenience me, and I feel so ashamed of my behavior. I feel like there was just crossed wires, but Allie really was bullying Eliza and finding creative ways to essentially make her uncomfortable and squeeze her out of our dynamic. I don't know why or how she thought any of that was appropriate, but it's irrelevant, as my wife should have never been scared of telling me how she really feels. And yeah, I work with Allie. That is a complication that I hadn't considered. I wouldn't worry about her causing drama in the workplace, though, because she values her job greatly. But I wouldn't be surprised about some passive-aggressive attitude being thrown my way. Oh well. 
I guess I'll have to wait and see what happens, but I'm uninterested in any form of reconciliation if she's going to be that disrespectful. Edit. The reason that Ali is out of my life is because I raised the point in the first place. That's more to do with her than me or my passivity. And yeah, I'm aware it was a problem. You're dang right it was a problem. But it feels like even when I'm trying to right the wrong, I'm getting a finger wagging, really. I don't mind criticism, but at this point, it feels a bit like I'm getting blows for new reasons. I didn't pick up on Ali's terrible behavior before. I felt like it was crossed wires at first. But the reason why she isn't talking to me is because I told her off for treating Eliza like crap to begin with. I should have done it long ago. I acknowledge that, but let's not start fantasizing about a future where I will just welcome her back with open arms for treating my wife that way. It's not going to happen because I want a future with Eliza much more than I want a pal to have lunch with. I've messed up. I know I have, and I want to change it. Let's just be moving forward. Then OP replied to a comment asking if the underwear was his. I stopped fancying Allie in 2012 after she said she was taken. I didn't sleep with her, and I don't really care for that kind of speculation. It is just untrue and adds more fuel to the fire. People come across this stuff IRL, and it just exacerbates problems. Eliza came across one of the videos about my post on YouTube or TikTok, and it stirred up a lot of painful feelings, especially reading about your reactions. She was shocked that I sought online advice because I usually try to handle things by myself. She was more shocked by the comments that were overwhelmingly on her side. It helped her acknowledge how terrible and awful everything done to her had been, and we had a long talk about it. I've agreed not to talk to Allie, and she is clearly only interested in causing trouble for a cheap laugh. I mentioned the situation to HR, even the stinky underpants, and they said they'd speak to her and keep an eye on any potential developments, but so far, no trouble. As far as I know, Allie's been having lunch with another colleague, and now I go down to a neighboring cafe to grab a baked potato. Whenever I've been in her vicinity, she's just mumbled, all right, so I'm guessing there were some words between her and HR. And finally, OP replied, to another comment asking on how his wife is doing. She's doing well. So far, so good. We had a really successful couples counseling session, and it opened my eyes towards so much of my behavior, and how I was essentially permitting bad behavior for so long. I realized that it was becoming investing in something emotionally heavy, or even just a problem makes me really anxious, so I try to distance myself from conflict. It used to be whenever my relatives fought, they would figuratively sort of pull at me like a ragdoll into taking their side, and that behavior upset me so much that any sort of conflict was off-putting to me. But I realized that when I essentially do that, I leave problems completely unsolved and cause my loved ones pain due to my own anxieties. So, if someone is mistreating someone I love, I'm not in their corner like I should be. A big part of these counseling sessions is figuring out how to manage accountability and not just being like, oh, it's my childhood, blah, 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 and stepping up to the mantle into making things right. Me and Eliza now do daily check-ins, like, how are you feeling today? How are you managing that? Is there anything you're not happy about? And what can be done to help you? So far, it's been really helpful, as she seems in much better spirits, and we've been having date nights again, which is great. Aside from the occasional disagreement, things genuinely have improved. As for Allie, well, things haven't changed much, but luckily the work situation has been tolerable. I'm surprised how much I like eating outside work, to be honest. Can't stand the canteens. The food is terrible. There, there was so much to this one, I don't even know what to comment on. I'm going to say right now, if I met Eliza's brother, him and I could not be friends, all right? I joke around too much. I don't do the roasting joking around, but like, like, if someone can't take a joke, I can't be that person's friend. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not blaming anybody. But it seems like uh, Allie and Eliza were just so polar opposites on the joke spectrum, and then it didn't gel well. And then we realized that Allie is probably a bully and was making too many jokes, but then OP was in the middle, but not in the middle, and was like, hey, I should be in the middle. And I don't know. It's just a lot of personal shortcomings, and uh, it seems like everything has been addressed. I don't know what's going on with Allie. We don't know if she's addressing anything she's got going on, but we know that OP and Eliza are happy. We know that they are working through stuff. We know that their marriage is thriving. We know that they're in counseling together. You know they are checking in on each other, and um, yeah, okay. But anyway, what are your thoughts on the story, everybody? Next story. Story number three. Should I remove my wig to accommodate a co-worker's sensory perception issues? I am a middle 
middle-aged woman with hair loss. It's not alopecia. It is caused by my hypothyroidism, but I have been told it's technically not considered medical hair loss. This is important. I wear wigs, like, all the time. I rarely leave the house without one on, and I frequently wear them in my home, too. Jay is a co-worker who has autism, anxiety, and multiple sensory perception issues. The company is committed to accommodating these, and I completely agree with that. For a little context, my son and daughter are both neurodivergent and have their own differences, which I hope their workplaces will always accommodate. Jay recently learned that I wear wigs. This bothers him to the point of distraction and anxiety where he cannot focus on anything when I am present. He stares at my head and seems unable to stop. He asked me if I could take it off for him just so that he could see my head and that maybe after that he'd be able to get back to normal. But he admitted he doesn't know if that would work and that he might still be unable to function normally with me around wearing my wig. I told him I would think about it, but everything inside me says no. This was last week and I haven't seen him since then, but he escalated the matter. I've been told that since I'm essentially wearing my wig for cosmetic reasons rather than a medical reason, I have to remove it to be in compliance with Jay's accommodations. I then said I would agree to remove it for him privately once, but I do not want to agree to never wear a wig around him. This would be distressing for me. This matter was reviewed for a day before I received a response this morning. Essentially, I have now been told that this is my only vanity and I need to get on board with accommodating Jay's very real issues, even if that means going wigless at work. I don't know what to do. Should I contact Jay about it personally or continue to only communicate through my supervisor and HR? What are my options? Edit. I've been asked how Jay learned I wear wigs. I am actually very open about it. Jay was present and within clear hearing distance when a colleague and I had a conversation about it. Edit number two. I'm going to share a couple things about me, so this might make more sense of it. First, I'm known for being very strong, tough. I'm the only woman in my department and in our immediate adjacent departments. My co-workers would likely never think that my hair loss is truly upsetting for me. I'm sure they think that I've taken it in stride and wear wigs for the fun of it. Second, everyone knows my son is autistic and I care very deeply about the challenges autistic people face. A few years ago, I helped a former co-worker who also has autism fight for accommodations regarding the mask issue. So, being that I'm perceived as tough but also quite sympathetic towards the needs of autistic people, I'm sure that they all thought I would immediately agree to whatever would make Jay comfortable. Here are some more relevant comments. User 1 said, Who told you your hair loss wasn't medical hair loss? You have hair loss due to a medical condition, hypothyroidism, as you said. Why does your coworker's medical condition trump yours? Initially, I was told that, both by my insurance company and then my doctor's office when I asked to get a wig covered by my health insurance. My hair loss is a side effect of a medical condition, not a medical condition in and of itself. This is also what was told to me by HR this week when this began. Company policy states that my hair loss is not a medical condition in and of itself and thus my wig wearing is only for cosmetic purposes. Jay's sensory perception issues outweigh my vanity. Vanny user 2 said, HR has told you that your wig is your only vanity and you need to get on board with accommodating Jay's very real issues, even if it means going with Wigless at work? Is this what HR is telling you? Yes, the HR person with whom I have been communicating with is a man with hair loss who keeps his head shaved bald. He made a point of mentioning it and expressed that he empathizes with my desire to not be wigless at work, but that doesn't change their stance. Then user 3 said, hers isn't anywhere as serious. She just wants to wear her wig. That might be a legal accommodation, but it's not comparable to sensory issues. Glasses are needed for eyesight, just as crucial as sensory focus. Backpacks are needed to move stuff. Her wig is needed to pretend she has hair that by now everyone knows she hasn't. I get her point, but come on, to say that an autistic person should be effectively put in danger of losing their job because she wants to wear her wig is not only ridiculous, it's downright evil. No, I don't wear it to pretend I have hair. I sometimes wear high heels, and at 5'10", it's not to pretend I'm taller than I am. I wear wigs because I hate the way I look without them. It makes me cry. It makes me sick to my stomach. I cannot stand for people to see me that way. People do treat me differently when they say they see me without any head covering, and that is an issue as well. Update. A few hours later on a similar post on a different subreddit. I'm currently having an issue at work, which I posted about earlier today here. Earlier in the week, I had a brief conversation about it with Emily from HR, who informed me that my coworker had gone to them about his problem with me, and she asked me a few questions.
Austin's. Completely standard procedure here. This morning, I had a conversation with Tim from HR, who is the person actually handling it. Just now, I received a message from Emily. She said she wants to call me to talk about it off the record. This may seem self-explanatory, but I'm trying to understand the motivation. Is it off the record for her protection or for mine? Should I even take her call? Edit. First, thank you all very much for your advice. I truly appreciate it. Edit 2. Emily is in HR temporarily, while someone else, Alicia, is on maternity leave. Edit number 3. I decided to take Emily's call, but only listen. Emily said she was calling to tell me that when I reply to Tim's email, I can CC Alicia. She said that Alicia is checking her email regularly. I thanked her and we ended the call. The important part here is that Alicia is a black woman who herself wears wigs, and wigs are at the heart of this issue, so she may have a different take on all of this. Final update on the original post one day later. Basically, after this issue was brought to the attention of someone else from HR, Alicia, a lot happened very quickly. I had a video chat with Alicia, Tim, the HR person who initially told me I would have to remove my wig, and one of the higher-ups in HR, as well as someone from legal. So, once the right people were alerted to what was happening, it was taken very seriously. I was assured in the video chat, as well as via text and phone call with Alicia, in addition to multiple emails and documents, that I will not be asked or required to remove my wig. Jay and I are to not have any further communication regarding this. We've both been instructed that if either of us attempts to discuss it with the other, we are to report it. So, it's over. I appreciate all the comments, advice, and support I received here. Thank you. Edit. Why did HR entertain this? Well, unfortunately, in the past, my company had a pattern of failing to provide accommodations to people with disabilities, especially those with invisible disabilities. In recent years, they've been making strong efforts to change that. I think this is an example of the HR rep involved overzealously attempting to accommodate someone who they already know has disabilities because they don't want to be accused of not accommodating people again. I, I'm, I'm not I'm not touching this one. I, 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 I don't, I'm not I'm not touching this one. <laughs> I'm not touching this with a 10-foot pole. I don't even have opinions to hide away from you. I just, I don't want to comment on this. I get where Jay's coming from. I get where OP's coming from. I'm not going to say this is more than that and this is who's and what and left and right and up and down and zig and zag. No, you're not getting anything out of me, folks, all right? We're getting a silly ending, an upbeat ending. I'm a dancing right now. I'm not dancing, but I have way too much energy. Let me calm down because we're at the end of the video, guys. I want to thank you all so much for watching. We're so close to 10,000 subscribers. Can you believe it? Me in this recording booth, those silly stories on your screen, you watching them on your screen. I love you guys so much, and it makes me so happy. Oh, my God. But anyway, guys, what do you think about this story? Feel free to civilly discuss this one in the comments. But anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.